be in Matthew chapter number 17. I didn't intentionally uh, this know that this was going to be a study like it has, but the Lord's given us maybe about five different uh, weeks maybe of this, uh, this thought. Uh, I really thought last week I'd just share a message, but um, the, the, way the, the way the Lord uh, laid it on us will just uh, break this apart week by week. Uh, last week we talked about the faith to move mountains and it's going to be kind of a little series that we've got going here on Wednesdays and we do need the faith to move mountains and last week if you remember we talked about unbelief in other words we just don't have the belief that to, to move the mountains and it keeps us from mountains to be moved and God doing the supernatural and you know I don't know uh, I'm not God or anything but it's amazing that last week was about unbelief and then someone gets saved. And then uh, this week, the faith to move mountains, it takes God and the glory of God. And I'll tell you, there's no way to imagine and to put into words the glory of God when someone gets saved like that. But uh, I'll tell you, I felt like my heart was about to explode myself and just knowing uh, just how good God is. But let's look at Matthew chapter 17. We'll read 19 through 20 here this evening uh, about faith to move mountains. It says this, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said to them, Because, you're, because of your unbelief. We looked at that last week. It's because of their unbelief that kept them from doing the supernatural. But it says, For verily I say unto you, If you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word and we thank you for your goodness, Lord, and how good you've been to all of us. Thank you, Lord, that you're still saving souls and you've not changed a bit. Lord, just help us and strengthen us and you do a work as only you can do and just help us and bless us tonight. Give us clarity of thought and just be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been, we've been studying here the faith to move mountains and just a recap uh, a little bit from last week. Uh, in this text, these disciples, they brought this man. He, this man brought his boy. He had his demon inside him. And in verse number 16, they, it says, And they brought him to his disciples, and they could not cure him. So it was a supernatural agency involved, because we find out later that it was a demon inside this boy, and he couldn't be healed. And, but the thing was, we said in Matthew 10 and verse number 1 last week, that Jesus equipped his disciples. They were equipped to do the supernatural. He told them to, to, that they had the ability to do this. But the thing was, they, they, they were unable. And in that verse that we just read in verse 20, it says, because of your unbelief. Because of unbelief, they were unable. It wasn't anything to do with, with who they are. I mean, they were equipped, but they had unbelief. And then in verse number 18, it said, And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and that child was cured that very hour. Aren't you glad that's the way Jesus works? It don't take a program or anything like that. It just takes Jesus. And as soon as a, uh, that prayer was prayed on that Sunday night, late at about 11 o'clock, that guess what? They're saved. Same way that that devil was rebuked out of this boy, that's the way Jesus works. And, and, I, and I'm glad that uh, all it takes is a simple, simple faith. In verse number 19, we read that then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And it was really that unbelief. But we keep going in, in verse number 20. It says, because of your unbelief, but it says, for verily I say unto you, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So he's saying here, if you just have the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, not the entire seed. I even heard it quoted this week. said, all it takes is a grain of mustard, uh, this, like a seed, grain, a seed of mustard. But it's not just the seed, it's the inside grain of the mustard. But he says if we have that, we will be able to move mountains there in verse number 20. Can we move mountains? No. We can't move the mountains. But I know somebody that can. And all it takes is faith in Him. And I just think back to salvation again. Salvation, that's a mountain. And the only way to move that is through God and allowing God to do a work and listen to that Holy Spirit convicting the heart. But if we'll just allow God to work, a big, big God can do 
big, big things. If we just let it. And isn't that amazing what kind of God that He is? He's saying that if you just have that little faith in a big thing, you can do big things. And just lay it, they just had left that Mount of Transfiguration and we've seen that and hinted at it last week. But uh, and he, very well he could have been saying there, you're going to have faith to move mountains just like that mountain I was just on. You guys wasn't here and you guys didn't witness what their mother disciples witnessed. But if you'd just seen it, my gosh, just a faith is a grain of mustard seed, you'll be able to move mountains. Jesus very well could have been pointing to that mountain. And I want to look back at that mountain here for just a moment in our faith as a faith to move mountains because I want to look at God for just a minute. Because here's the thing. We can have faith all day long. But if my faith is in myself, it's not going to go very far. See, it takes unbelief. If we have unbelief, that keeps us from doing things. Well, does that mean I, if I believe it, I can achieve it? Well, guess what? There's preachers that say that. And if you believe it, you can achieve it. If you, that's, that's all you. That's leaving out a supernatural power and a supernatural force. It's not a, I can, if I believe it, I can achieve it. It's a, I believe it, and God can do it through us. I mean, it takes faith in Him, and faith is a grain of mustard seed in Him. There ain't no mountain to be moved if they ain't no God. we got to have God. See, our faith and our hope and our trust and everything is built on God. And, and we read that really in verse in, in the, the very first of chapter number 17. Look at verse number 1. It says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them to the high mountain apart. So Jesus here, he takes these three disciples, and in just doing so, he fulfills uh, a prophecy. Because look back at another verse in chapter 16, verse number 28. It says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste, taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom. He says, hey, there's some of you right here and you're getting ready to see the Son of Man in the kingdom before you ever taste death. I mean, I'm sure they heard that and they thought, well, how, what is he talking about? Well, he just fulfills this prophecy. It says, after six days, Jesus takes... Peter, James, and his brother, John, his brother, bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And I'll tell you, life can bring us some mountains, and we can have some highs. But I'll, I'll tell you, God will put you on some mountains, and he'll put you on some places to where it don't matter what's going on. God, can, when his glory shows up, and, and, he, and his glory is all about, there ain't nothing going on but God. There ain't nothing going on but His glory. There ain't nothing going on but, but what, what He's got going on. And we read in verse number 2, And was transfigured before them, and His face did shine as the sun, and His raiment was white as the light. So Jesus here is transfigured. He's transfigured before these three, and it reminds me of Revelation in the picture that we've seen in Revelation it's his face did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as the light. A picture of purity and, and, and just holiness when I see that and, and picture that. And in verse number three it says, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah uh, talking with him. So Moses and Elijah here, they appear with him. But then verse number five says, And while he had yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Ye hear him. So he says, Hey, this is my beloved Son. And they hear that. And then they say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And it says, Hey, hear him. So God here shows himself off in this bright cloud. Jesus shows him off as this light. But then God shows off in this bright cloud. And this cloud, it's the very presence of God that's showing off itself. And then, then God here is pleased with his son and God is speaking. They hear audibly, they hear God. And in verse number 6 it says this, and it says that when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and they were sore afraid. They fell on their face. And I'll tell you, there's many places, and I'm not going to turn to them for time's sake, but many places where God spoke to somebody and they were just down on their face, sore afraid because they're in the presence of God. Remember, this is three disciples. This is not all the disciples. 
And I wish everybody could witness and get a part and get a glimpse of when God shows up and see the things that God reveals. I'm telling you. If you'd have been here on that Sunday night, I was telling Gary on the way in, I don't know that I'll ever forget that night and, the, and just uh, her saying that prayer out loud and God just, the presence of God. And, and God comes through in these supernatural ways and He's showing off to these three disciples here. Well, verse number 7 says, And, and Jesus came and touched them. Now wait just a minute. God said a minute ago, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. It says, hear ye Him. You better listen to Him. Well then here comes Jesus and He touched them and said, arise and be not afraid. In other words, hey, you can get up. There's nothing to be scared of. I'll tell you, when it comes to our human form and our human ability, it's easy to be afraid. It's easy to see that we're not adequate. I mean, we're on holy ground and see just how adequate, how inadequate we are and how big of a God that He is. But he, Jesus says, Arise and be not afraid. It says, And when they lit, had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And they came down from the mountain, and Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. I mean, can you imagine than what had taken place. And there's no way to put that in words what they saw. Us reading it, we're not even grazing the surface of what they saw. And you know, you try to explain church services that we have and how God comes through and you just had to be there. I mean, that's sometimes what you got to say is you just had to be there. I mean, uh, Thomas, what, where were you at? Jesus showed up and Thomas, you up there. You just, you just had to be there to see it. And I couldn't imagine seeing what they saw and being there. And I'll tell you, I, I really, I don't know how God works. I don't understand how He operates. But to know that this is where I was preaching on Wednesday, and then Sunday night, I, it's all day Sunday, to be honest with you. But then Sunday night, to feel like I'm one of them on that mountain and just get that kind of a feel and that kind of presence, uh, I was heard a preacher preach this week on the, the 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 whole the glory of God coming around, and he said, "Hey, you get in the glory of God, and you get in the presence of God. You ain't, you ain't gonna care about nothing that takes place." I heard a preacher say that this week, and I got to thinking, "My gosh, that's the truth if I've ever heard it." I didn't care what time it was. I didn't care. Uh, I didn't care what was going on on the news. I didn't care what was going on outside this church just in the presence of God and just what a holy and a perfect God that he is. But see, what this did is it fulfilled verse number 28. It said, there, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So one prophecy was fulfilled in this taking place. Two, Jesus was transfigured. Can you imagine that? I mean, seeing that. But then you've seen Moses appear. I mean, these three, Peter, James, and John, seen Moses, and he had been dead for some 1,700 years. Then Elijah, for 1,100 years, hadn't been seen. He was called out of here, as we preached a few weeks ago. Then you've seen this bright cloud show up. That's visible evidence of God. Then they heard God talk that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Then they heard Jesus speak and him say, Arise, get on up from here. And you just don't be afraid. I'm with you. You imagine the peace and the I, 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 that tranquility. I, it would have to relate to heaven. It'd have to be close to heaven to where you're in the presence of God, not worthy of anything, and you just arise and be not afraid. I can't even imagine. But to sum up what they saw is they got a glimpse of the glory of God. They got a glimpse of His glory. They got a glimpse of just a heavenly state of what heaven would be like. They got a glimpse of really what is yet to come. They saw Moses. They saw Elijah. And that had to show them that, my gosh, this place that we're headed is real. This God that we're serving is real. You can sum up what they saw by one word, and it's the word is God. And with the faith to move mountains, it's going to take one word, and it's going to take God. 
And I'll tell you this, sometimes he just shows off, he shows out, he operates, and you just can't explain it no other way than that. I mean, as a preacher, I mess things up and I don't do things, everything perfect. But then God shows up and, my gosh, that's just God. And Peter, James, and John there in verse number 17, or in chapter number 17, up there on that mountain, they seen uh, just, uh, I can't imagine, but we're going to just say God and His glory. But I want everybody to turn here. I'm going to kind of go a circle and end up back where we started, I believe. But I want to look at Peter for just a second. I want to go to 2 Peter and show you something I learned this week. 2 Peter, uh, can you imagine the impression of being off that mountain and just what an impression that had to have left on Peter? Well, guess what? You, you, we see that in 2 Peter. In 2 Peter 1, in verse number 14, 2 Peter 1, 14, I read this. It says, Knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Now take a time out right there. He's, he didn't know. This is 2 Peter 1, 14. He's, he's saying that I'm getting ready to put off my body. I'm getting ready to die in this tabernacle. Peter here is winding up at the end of his life and he's saying, hey, I'm getting ready to put off this tabernacle. I'm getting ready to leave my body just as Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Well, he's referring back to that Mount of Transfiguration. That left such an impact on him. He's still talking about it close to his death. So much that he's winding up his life and he's still speaking of it. Look at verse 15. It says, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able to, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. In other words, the things that I've spoke about, the things that I've, I've preached on, the things that I've taught on, they're going to come to remembrance. And you will always be able to remember these things after I'm dead and gone because God's continual forever. And the things that I, the gospel I preach stands for to the test of time. Verse number 16 says, For we have not Follow cunningly devised fables. I ain't coming to hear a fairy tale. I'm not coming to hear self-help motivation. What I'm coming is I'm coming and I'm hearing a gospel that's preached that even a six-year-old that is coloring in a coloring book can listen and hear and it's so simple that it can prick a child's heart and they can understand. And he says, I'm not preaching fables. I'm not telling fairy tales. And he says, when I make it known unto you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are, were eyewitnesses of His majesty. In other words, we were eyewitnesses up on that mountain. I seen what took place up on that mountain. And, and you're gonna, I, and I'm an eyewitness that God's a living God. I'm a breathing, living testimony that God is real. He saved my soul, and I know that I'm saved. I can know that He's living in my heart. And I, I've seen Him do things. I've seen Him meet needs. I've seen Him set goals, but I've seen God overcome those goals. I know I've had obstacles, and you've had obstacles, and we've had doubts, but God has overcome every bit of that. And that's what Peter's saying. He says, I've got a real God. That when I'm dead and gone, you'll just still remember that God. You'll still remember what he's done. Verse number 16, uh, or 17 says, um, for, we, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When he came from such a voice of him of excellence glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Exactly what he heard on that mountain. What Peter's quote. He says, in this voice which come from heaven, we heard, and we were with him on that holy mount. Again, he's speaking of that mount. He's speaking of what he's seen. And he, in verse number 14, he's saying, shortly there's coming a time that I'm going to leave my body. Every single one of us, it may be very soon. Just talking to somebody just today, I don't know, maybe a young six or seven year old girl uh, on their way to Asheville to pick out a Halloween costume just last week, I think we might have been, last Friday night, I believe, we were in Asheville at the time. They had had the mountain closed in Madison County, and what I'd heard is someone had done a U-turn in that middle of that road, but when they'd done that U-turn, hit that other car head on, killed that little girl. What I'm saying is uh, death has it's no respect or of age. In other words, uh, it's coming to us all. Uh, death is coming to every single one of us. 
And in 2 Peter 1 and 15, it says these things ought to be remembered. After I'm dead and after I'm gone, these things that I've spoke about, these things that I've preached about ought to be remembered. And Peter, out of all the things that took place in Peter's life, he says, I want you to remember one thing. What took place on that mountain? And I want you to remember the glory of God. Because in verse number 16 says, we are ends by saying eyewitnesses of His majesty. I have eyewitnessed His majesty. I have witnessed the glory of God. And in verse 17, for He received from God the Father and the honor have its glory. And from He got honor and He got glory. Peter didn't want to be remembered for who he was. He says, if you remember anything, I want you to remember the Father and I want you to remember His, to honor Him and I want you to remember to glorify the Father. Above all things, remember that. But take a time out just a minute. What about what Peter did in his life? See, I was thinking, when I'm dead and gone, if I want to remember a sermon that was preached or what happened in a church? No. I hope that we're all living, breathing testimonies of God that when we're dead and gone, they remember God. Because Peter done some more amazing things than any of us will ever do. Think about Peter walking on water. Peter's the only person I know to walk on water other than the Lord. Peter walked on water in Matthew 14 and 23. It says, when he sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain apart to pray and he was alone there. Uh, he, he sent that ship and he was alone, but he come walking. They didn't know who he was. He come walking. He went apart to pray. They thought they didn't know where Jesus was at. But then out, out, out on that water, it gets rough. They see that spirit, thought it was a spirit. Everybody's troubled, but what did Peter do? He said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come walk upon the water with you. As great as... Peter's final words were, he didn't say, hey, remember that time I walked on water? He didn't say that. He says, remember the Lord. Remember to honor Him. Remember to glorify Him. Think about Pentecost. 3,000 souls saved. That was in Peter's lifetime. I mean, 3,000 souls, my gosh, we'd be writing books and doing autographs and I don't know what we'd do. But he says, don't remember that. He don't want that to be remembered. I mean, he's winding up his life, and in 2 Peter 1, he don't mention either one of these. That was in Acts 12, 11. It says, Peter, was, came, when he came to himself, said now, uh, or no, Acts 2, 41, and they said, and gladly they received his word and baptized that same day and added to them 3,000 souls. Can you imagine? And he says, I don't want you to remember me walking on water. I don't want you to remember 3,000 souls saved. But then think about him released from jail. James and John had then been put to death. Herod was wanting to please the Jews to put Peter to death as well. He's arrested. He's put in prison. But the God, in, in Acts, it records the events of God sending an angel to release him from prison. And in Acts 12, 11, it says, When he came to his cell, now I know surety the Lord had sent an angel. Peter finally got his bearings straight and got straightened out. And he says, I surely know that was God and that was an angel. I mean, that's something supernatural. But he don't want that remembered either. You may say, preacher, what are you saying then? Well, I'm saying what Peter said. He said in verse number 17, for he received God the Father, honor and glory. And in verse number 18, he says, and this, from, from, and this voice which came from heaven heard when we were with him on that holy mount. Peter simply wanted God to be honored God to be glorified and of everything in our life. That's what we should want. It's God to get glory above everything. I want to go back to that faith to move mountains now. What, how does this relate to the faith to move mountains? Can you imagine the impression that must have had on Peter that his life's winding down and he'd done some amazing things in his life but he realized this. He's like, I wouldn't have done these amazing things if it hadn't been an amazing God. Well, what are we preaching on? Faith is a grain of mustard seed to do amazing things. Well, how are we going to do amazing things? With amazing God. It's the only way to do it. Peter walked on water, 3,000 souls at Pentecost, released by prison from an angel, and Peter knew this. It wasn't Peter. It was God. And we owe our whole life to God. As one of the children just quoted, it's just all the way down to our basic faith of salvation. Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. 
It's not of ourselves. Even salvation, it's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Why? Because men would boast. Men would say that they did it. It's a gift of God. We're studying our faith to move mountains. Number one was unbelief. Unbelief will keep us. It kept these disciples from not healing that boy. But here we see God and his role in faith to move mountains. I'll tell you, it don't take a lot of faith. It don't take an eloquent prayer. It's all it takes is faith in God. A faith in something and God will do it. It don't take nothing amazing or nothing special. I got this card here, How to Get to Heaven, and I was just trying to show Harper the pictures and illustrations and just try to help her that other night. And I, I just said, hey, you just have to read a prayer like this, and there's a sample, or say a prayer like this, and there's a sample prayer. And she said, I need to get saved. I want the Lord to save me. But I don't know, I can't say that prayer like that. I said, hey, you don't have to say a prayer like that. It's simple. Just ask him, tell him you know. I said, hey, do you know you're a sinner? And it's just so simple. And just ask him to come in your heart. You don't have to do this and do that and check a list and check a box. Faith to move mountains. We can move the hugest mountain in, under the sun. I mean, that's salvation right there. That is what salvation is. But then after that, God wants our church to do big things. He wants our church to do great things. Each member to do great things. But it takes faith as a grain of a mustard seed. In Matthew 17, 20, if you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove your hence in this yonder place. You may say, well, preacher, what's the limit? What can I not do? Well, with God, all things are possible. With God, you can do anything. If we ever have that unbelief, it'll restrict us. It'll hurt other people. If we try to do it in our own power, that wouldn't be too good. We're not going to do anything. But Matthew 17, 20, after he mentions the faith as a grain of mustard seed, and you're able to move mountains, it ends with this thought, nothing shall be impossible unto you. How can nothing be impossible? Because there's a God, and the faith is in that God. I mean, think of that Mount of Transfiguration and what that did to Peter. I want you to think back in your own life of the things that God has done supernaturally. And you can only say it's God. We need to cling to those things and lift those things up. That when these other obstacles come, we lean on that same God that got us through these other things. What a God that we serve of the week. If we just give him that glory like Peter did. So much, so many preachers, though, would be saying, look at what I did. Look at what my church did. But that's not what it's about. He says, look at what God did. And God help us as Ron Curry and as a pastor, as members, to give God the credit for everything. And I'll tell you, there is no moving mountains with unbelief. There is no moving mountains without God. Appreciate the Lord and giving us this thought. I appreciate Him. All you can say is showing us a supernatural illustration on Sunday night of His glory, and that's just God. He's the only person that can do stuff like that. Um, I never thought in a million years that's the way our day started. That it could get better than when I left. But what a day! may say, preacher, how are you holding it together? Well, I ain't held it together the last few days, so I've got it together now. So uh, I just get thinking about it in the car. My eyes would tear up. Just what a loving God that he is and how good he has been. I mean, he didn't have to be that way. But then you look at the child, they didn't have to do what they did either. And then I think of, and I want to talk to her, but I want to think of the, the boldness. There's men sitting here. There's a man standing here behind the pulpit that ran from God much, much longer. And I'll tell you, what a, what a thing. What a God. The faith is a mustard seed. We've seen that even play out in our church. And who knows in the coming weeks, my gosh, ain't no telling what 
God's going to do over the course of time. But what a, what a God that we serve. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so thankful and grateful that you're alive and you're well and you are still saving souls. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you showed Peter what you showed him, but Lord, the, the impression that it made on him. And no matter what he did, and no matter how you used him, he never forgot the source. I know he denied you. I know he wasn't perfect. But Lord, all the way up to his death, he was given, he still, going back to that mountaintop experience. Lord, there's members here, myself included, that I can always go back to that October, at that revival meeting when I accepted you as my Savior. That mountaintop experience that I felt like I was just on top of that mountain and you're the only one that could do it. Lord, we all have those experiences, but we can't forget those things. And faith to move mountains, it takes just remembering what you've done. Remembering what you've done. Knowing that you're the one that done it. And Lord, just having the faith to just keep on going. Keep on doing things for you. Lord, just be with us as we continue our study as we look at prayer and fasting over the next few weeks and then also how we play a part as well in getting the job done. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.